So Professor Marion Copemans uh, is head of the Department of Virosirence Viro at the Erasmus Medical Centre in Rotterdam. She's also a professor of virology at the Laboratory of Infectious Diseases of the National Institute of Public Health. And Marion has wide ranging interests and responsibilities around diagnostics, research, surveillance, emergency preparedness, etc., for viral diseases. Welcome, Marion. Well, thank you, and thank you for the invitation to uh, uh, present some of my uh, views on uh, challenges and opportunities in risk assessment for viruses. And that's a debate that I've had for a long time with Ari Haverlaar. So it's also nice to be in the same session here. <laughs> Um, so, for, for, uh, as we have heard this morning, and as you uh, probably are aware of from the uh, current uh, literature, um, if we look at the question of uh, foodborne viruses, it's clear that there is um, one pathogen that is uh, leading the ranks right now, if you, uh, based here on a study that's done in, uh, in the US, looking at uh, community cases, uh, hospitalizations, then clearly the, the uh, highest uh, um, uh, ranking pathogen is norovirus. And the picture changes if you look at the severe spectrum of illness where hepatitis A pops up as probably the most, um, uh, con uh, the pathogen considered most relevant in terms of uh, foodborne transmission. So these are fecal uh, orally transmitted human viruses where uh, food uh, can be a vehicle for that transmission. And um, the, uh, with that, I'm also saying there's also other modes of transmission person to person, and that has been uh, quite challenging, challenging uh, in trying to uh, identify what the uh, contribution is of foodborne transmission in the whole epidemiology of these viruses. But norovirus and hepatitis A are up there, listed here in a, uh, a list of other enteric pathogens that use the same modes of transmission, but that are less well uh, documented in my view. In my talk, I also want to uh, uh, bridge a bit to the field of emerging viruses, because that's also what we're dealing with, and what can we learn from these viruses that where we now do have some estimates uh, for the emerging uh, virus field. Now in doing so, I want to point out a few things, and these are listed from uh, uh, what I consider a nice uh, guide from the uh, USDA EPA on factors to specifically consider when doing a microbial risk assessment compared to uh, chemical risk assessments. Um, and there are some uh, highlighted here in blue uh, that I will go into. Starting with uh, genetic diversity. So we talk about the noroviruses, but that's, I, in my view, a clear misnomer. This is the, the taxonomic uh, uh, representation of the, the norovirus, uh, uh, the Khaleesi virus family with two genera here of norovirus that are very diverse, branching again into lineages. And the m most of what we currently recognize as the burden of norovirus disease is really caused by a few of those uh, genotypes. Yet there is a whole other world out there that may contribute to impart to uh, some level of protective immunity, but we do not understand that very well. So what we do know is comes, a lot of that comes from population-based uh, studies uh, with some extrapolations about uh, the severe spectrum, uh, including mortality. But where I think we really uh, are starting to see significant impact that is poorly quantified presently is the impact in healthcare settings. What we do see is, a, is really a change in the population of people that are hospitalized to more severe comorbidities. And what we see there is, uh, for instance, norovirus as a problem uh, causing chronic uh, infection, um, including diversification of these viruses into uh, yet more variants. And that's, a, that's an area that I really think needs more study. The other element is uh, we do see new variants popping up every now and then. What is the role of the animal uh, world there? Because we do see uh, similar viruses circulating in a broad range of 
uh, uh, animal species, including um, uh, animals used for food production. Because then uh, I would like to talk about virus evolution, a, a clear problem. We, many of the uh, foodborne viruses, but also emerging viruses, are RNA viruses that are sloppy in their replication. And by doing that, they, uh, uh, the replication allows for incorporation of mutations. So you, any uh, 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 person with, a, in this case, a norovirus infection, will in fact carry a swarm of viruses with di different mutants. And if you add a selection, a selection force on that, it's very easy to select a variant that escapes that particular selection force, like immunity. And that's why we see what we see. So for instance, noroviruses like influenza evolves quite rapidly. For flu, we are used to, uh, to the, the updates of the vaccine every other year because the viruses have drifted so far that the vaccine immunity does not protect uh, anymore. Similar patterns we see with noroviruses. These viruses evolve through mutations into subsequent uh, antigenic variants, and there's very little protective immunity to the previous variants uh, if these new variants pop up. And this is a global pattern. And then the second mechanism <coughs> uh, is that of uh, what is, has been termed viral sex, because that gives you uh, good book titles that you can sell, but it is a reassortment or recombination. Um, so that is the mixing of viral genes because uh, that you can see if you have two related viruses infect the same host and the same cell. And what comes out is progeny virus that is composed with parts of the genes of one and parts of the other. So these are really new viruses. Now, how common is that? Um, um, it, that depends on what is, if there's opportunity, and this is one, has been one of my drivers for going for looking for foodborne disease problems with norovirus in that in foodborne outbreaks, due to the nature of the contamination, which can be sewage related or irrigation water related, we see quite frequent um, uh, evidence for recombinant strain emergence. That's illustrated here. This is a so-called tanglegram. So what this is, is a genetic relatedness tree based on, um, uh, and what's done here is do that on one part of the norovirus genome and on another part. And if these viruses are uh, sort of the, the normal genomes, you would see a straight line here. But what you see in this case is a lot of crossover and that means there's a lot of mixed genomes here. So recombination is quite, common in the evolution of, uh, of these viruses and other RNA viruses. Now what, can, what consequence can that have? So uh, uh, again, uh, the, the, what we currently know about uh, the norovirus impact is mostly based on impact of uh, gene, group, gene group 2, 4, and 2, 3 viruses. But this is what happens under the radar. This is uh, uh, the emergence of a particular variant, very different from these ones that we know, that first was picked up in Kenya from environmental uh, surveillance um, and not seen in human illness, but in the last winter really has dominated the scene in several Asian countries. And we now are wondering whether or not this is going to be a, a, a virus that is going to replace the current dominant uh, norovirus strains. Um, has this happened before? Yes, we think so. There's now uh, emerging evidence from studies where uh, we look at antibody profiles. Um, this is uh, uh, from uh, antibody profiles in three different age cohorts. It may be hard to see, but uh, 1963, 1983, and then very recent. And you see big shifts in the prevalence of antibodies to different norovirus genotypes over time. And particularly the ones that we now consider the big impact viruses, G24, were not there in uh, 1963. So that uh, tells you about the, the dynamics uh, there. So how does that diversity picture uh, come into play if you look at uh, uh, foodborne uh, disease uh, estimates? So this is an approach that uh, has been developed by uh, Linda Verhoef trying to use uh, 
um, a crude, I must say, very crude attribution method where we have compared more or less systematically uh, sampled uh, uh, surveillance data from environmental sampling and, and uh, uh, food sampling with uh, human disease uh, uh, sampling. And if you do that, you can s try and estimate what proportion um, uh, of disease by certain genotypes is food related. Now, if you do that, you really see big diversity over time. So um, again, uh, showing that this is certainly not a static uh, figure and that there's a lot of diversity out there. Now with diversity and with the use of uh, genome-based uh, uh, analysis of these kinds of pathogens, um, what you can look for is if there's maybe uh, signature information in that genome, and it just was also it came up in the previous talk. Uh, that's shown here for a different virus, hepatitis A, where you do see, if you look at, a, at sort of a higher level, uh, genotypes, you do see that the distribution of genotypes is quite different in different parts of the world. If you then zoom further in into the sequences, then uh, what it looks like is that you can use that information um, to, um, to try and identify where to look for sources of newly identified human cases. Here's an example of that, two examples actually. We've seen some, uh, I think the interest in hepatitis A as a football path pathogen is increasing and we've seen some examples here with berries and with uh, semi-dried tomatoes in Europe where the sort of the genome-based uh, ascertainment was used to try and point at least in the, in the direction of an area where to look for a source of uh, the infection. This example was an outbreak where there were a hepatitis A cases in Australia, in France, and in the Netherlands linked to an almost identical uh, sequence that pointed to uh, 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 manufacturing plants in, uh, in uh, this region of the world. But then the, the, there's the problem that um, uh, if you then try to really uh, go full cycle of evidence, that's proven to be very challenging. This is a very complex picture that illustrates the trace back that was done for that hepatitis A, for some of those hepatitis A outbreaks, where the conclusion was it really is not uh, possible because of the diversity of the food chain. I'm looking at Ernesto here. I think uh, I see you nodding. I think you agree there. So um, it's very difficult to get the full evidence uh, on the plate, uh, despite now uh, quite, well the the uh, advancement of molecular typing methods. So with this, I want to bridge to. So this is what we know for viruses where we think we can now come up with estimates. Uh, but what about the emerging disease uh, field? And I think we have to think quite broadly here. This is something that I find very interesting. So we have a big uh, oyster industry, um, and uh, shellfish are a known uh, source of, of foodborne viral outbreaks. And th there's a big uh, epidemic going on. Uh, there's massive die-off of uh, shellfish in, in European waters due to uh, a herpes virus and also due to a parasite. So with that, just looking at it, you can expect uh, market shifts and the most likely market shifts would be to regions where agriculture is booming business. Now, of course, we do have uh, good monitoring systems and so on, but this is one of the hidden ways by which the uh, pathogens that we introduce in the population could actually shift without us realizing it. Um, and th that, the problem is with, with many of these emerging viruses. This is a list here uh, of uh, emerging infections. I guess hepatitis E shouldn't be on, on the emerging disease list anymore. But um, in each of these examples, at some point, there was the scare and the question, could these pathogens be transmitted by the foodborne route? And even if the uh, uh, conclusion was, well, the likelihood of that is very small, uh, it's difficult to really uh, rule it out. Uh, here, pointing out also is that I think MERS coronavirus, we've done quite a bit of work here, I think maybe the first emerging disease example where really the increasing size of the population that is immunocompromised uh, 
becomes the entry point of these new infections because that's really what you see here as with the hepatitis E uh, in humans. Um, now, despite these uh, conclusions, uh, uh, like, uh, like with avian influenza, that the likelihood of foodborne transmission is very low, we still can see a lot of impact. This here is a map showing emergence of H7 and 9 in, uh, in Asia, in China, and this is the sales figures of Kentucky Fried Chicken that did not uh, get the benefit from the reassuring risk assessments that that uh, poultry consumption is a very unlikely mode of, uh, of uh, exposure to these viruses. So there's a big viral world out there with a lot of diversity. This is the virus sphere, and this is a picture from 2002 that needs heavy updating because with all the virome uh, studies, the, uh, the next-gen sequencing studies, a lot of new viruses are being discovered. And what are their roles? There's viruses, uh, of course, that we know infecting peoples, there's viruses infecting animals, but there's also the bacteriophages in that in, in ocean environments really play an important role in keeping the bacterial populations in check. And what does that do in human and animal health and disease. I think that's emerging knowledge. Um, here is a, an, an example where we are trying to apply the type of technology in a surveillance minutes, context. Minutes, Marion, please. Sorry? Two minutes, please. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm getting to the end. In a surveillance context, so this is the so-called 2% surveillance in Bangladesh. We are out of every uh, 100 uh, patients uh, hospitalized for diarrheal disease. Two of them go, the samples go into a biobank. And um, if you do, and they, they have been tested for the, the common culprits, the diarrheal disease pathogens, but here's what you see if you then do a metagenomic analysis. So in addition to the range of bacteria that, and viruses that have already been detected, you start to see a lot of additional, well, let's focus on the viruses here, in these uh, patients that and we don't know how that contributes to their disease uh, status. Uh, there sure is a lot of surveillance information in there, but how to use this type of data in the future of risk assessment is going to be a big nightmare, I think, for, for many. This is our attempt to try and work in that direction. This is a new EU-funded project coordinated by uh, DTU, Frank Aerstrup, and uh, myself where we are uh, trying to capture the developments in NGS sequencing for these kinds of questions. So saying, okay, if that is the future, we sure, uh, sure need to start thinking about how to capture all that data, but also how, what are the uh, effects of sampling, what are the effects of all these different platforms for analysis, what, how do you compare the data coming out of that, but also what are meaningful ways of trying to analyze that for clinical questions, uh, public health questions, and, and research. Uh, so in my view, um, uh, I do think that with the viral problems uh, uh, that we see, uh, and linking also to the emerging viral diseases, um, I do think we need to start thinking about how to take all this diversity into account in the types of uh, uh, risk assessment studies and priority exercises that we've been hearing about, because there you do not have time to gather all that evidence for the types of conclusions that now can be drawn for the more stu better studied uh, pathogens. And uh, in that, I do think we need to take, talk, take stock of that evolving world of the virome and microbiome. And, uh, I thank you for your attention. Okay, well, thanks for that very provocative uh, presentation. And, you know, obviously this whole area of um, viruses and emerging risks in food safety is one where we do have rather rudimentary knowledge. And I think the recent Codex guidelines from the Committee on Food Hygiene in their very generality um, make that message very strongly. There's a lot to learn. So maybe one question for Marion and then we must move on. Okay, well I'm all sure we're... All clear we'll... or all confused, but <laughs> either one. <laughs> it's, that nightmare is emerging. 